If we uh, wish to estimate life as a pleasant span of private activities, this is not an especially optimistic generation. More and more, world affairs have encroached upon the personal experiences of all of us. And to a large measure, this encroachment has been difficult for us to face. The average person, even though basically intelligent and well-intentioned, is not trained in international diplomacy. He is not trained in the principles of government. And although we go to the polls periodically to vote for various candidates, this does not always mean that we really understand these candidates or the platforms which they attempt to advance. We are inclined to judge candidates very largely by their pictures in the paper and their appearances on television. Of course, the picture may have been taken long before they got into politics and the uh, television profile heavily retouched. But at the same time, this is the way we come largely to our political decisions. We like people, we believe in people, we still remain a little gullible, and we are forever hoping for the best. This type of thinking hardly fits us for the situation that has developed within the last 50 years. Prior to that time, government was a business, handled very largely by a personnel more or less trained for the work, and the private citizen went along his way, living his life, raising his family, and advancing his business. Now all of this has been suddenly shifted. And because of the very principles upon which our way of life uh, is built, we are confronted with active participation, not only in international problems, but in more local situations that also have become more clearly defined to us all. Most of the newspapers today carry personal columns in which the opinions of readers on various matters are expressed. The same is true of many of our larger magazines and publications in this field. And, of course, as may be expected, these opinions frequently conflict. One individual will say a certain article was the finest he ever read. The next one will say that if it's repeated, he'll cancel his subscription. There just seems to be no way to get people together on issues of public importance. One thing, however, we all do get out of the press, and that is a headache. Everyone worries about some phase of it. And as the years go along and things get increasingly complicated, it becomes important for the average reader to have a larger comprehension with which to face this small black type that is thrown at him every day. Actually, we are in this world, obviously, for one purpose, and that is to learn something. Life is an experience in learning, and the richest life is the life which has learned the most. If this be considered the basis for our approach to all problems of value, uh, then we are enjoying extraordinary opportunities for never before has there been so much to learn, nor have we been required to assimilate it so rapidly. In addition to the international prospect, news is continually more intimate. Our local problems, the private situations of families, crime, alcoholism, narcotics, juvenile delinquency, uh, the problems of our freeways and our public utilities, 
all these come into the life of the citizen as never before. He suddenly seems to be living in a world very conglomerate, a mass of contending, dissenting pressures. He is invited to side with many different propositions. He is inclined to move into this pattern largely on the basis of personal feeling. And as a result, his emotions take a very severe beating if he is a thoughtful person. Of course, there are many kinds of human beings who read the paper. Some of these turn quickly to the cartoons, being the part which can probably be depended upon to be the least directed by policy. Others uh, favor the sports section, and I have several friends who never miss a line of the obituaries. Uh, the, these different intensities of interest affect naturally the attitude of the reader. Also, they express his attitude. And one of the first things I think we should bear in mind is that news is a report interpreted by the reader. Actually, the impact of news depends almost entirely upon the mental and emotional structure of the person reading the news. Now, if it is true, as we have been warned, that our nation is gradually turning into a mass of neurotics, it is evident that news can have a very serious effect upon persons mentally or emotionally unstable. Whereas in olden times news was comparatively simple, today it is highly complicated and controversial, and for the most part strongly directed. The newspaper breaks every rule of practical semantics where it is constantly attempting to sell us a point of view. And we wonder sometimes whose point of view, whether it represents a sincere effort to inform the people, or whether it has merely fallen under the general pattern of intense commercialization and simply feeds us what it thinks we will buy. There is a certain amount of truth in this observation, whether we want to admit it or not. But because we are essentially tense, nervous people, because we are doing everything with more nerve pressure than ever before, this comes into the reading of the paper and perhaps our emotional reaction to what we read. Actually, therefore, even if a paper told us the exact truth on all occasions, uh, did not in any way follow any directive pattern, was not associated with any political party, and was attempting to be fair in everything, still the reader could immediately bias the report, and would almost certainly do so. The reader reads not, usually, uh, to attain a greater store of fact. He reads to defend what he believes or assail what he does not believe. And as the average reader is not well informed, it is, there is no certainty that he will assail those things which are essentially wrong or defend those things which are essentially right. He may try to do so, but he has no infallibility in this area of his consciousness. Thus, the use of the newspaper uh, becomes a matter of the individual's ability to screen news through his own understanding. News differs from history in one essential difference. History brings to us a certain perspective. History is the record of things after the pressures of the moment have simmered down, and therefore history is a long-range look at events which have transpired and the consequences of which are still observable often in our social lives. On the other hand, news is immediate. 
It is not digested, it is not assimilated, it is not presented against any true perspective. Nor can we be certain that the report of today will not be contradicted tomorrow. News, therefore, is not only urgent, but ephemeral. It does not give us very much upon which, upon which to build any strong philosophical position. We can only wait until news becomes history, and very few people are able to wait. They must do something immediately to evaluate the occurrences of the day. Therefore, today, with all these pressures on us, perhaps it would be interesting to look back over the newspapers of long ago. The difference between these papers and our present uh, press. Not long ago, I went over some reasonably early files of American newspapers. Papers which were distinguished examples of journalism between 1850 and 1880. Several things immediately became obvious. First, in these earlier papers, there were very few banner heads. There was large print at the time of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. But for the most part, newspaper headings were comparatively small. There is no effort at direct sensationalism in the press. Articles, for the most part, were concise, and what would be hashed and rehashed through a dozen columns today perhaps had a respectable three inches at that time. News also contained many interesting sidelines that have disappeared entirely from our way of thinking. Throughout the press, were little flashes of educational material. It was not uncommon for the daily paper to carry interesting scientific notes and news, not merely the report of discoveries or the report of the launching of a projectile, uh, but I remember in one paper a long discussion of the Darwinian theory running through a large section of the newspaper a consideration and study of things that were interesting to the average person. Perhaps the most outstanding difference between the modern paper and its earlier uh, prototype was the advertising section. Ads in those days were very cheap, therefore very small. Today they are very expensive, therefore they are very large. Uh, an individual, for example, with a product usually announced it in anywhere from three to five lines. He would tell you that he has just invented a new can opener and is, in, is hoping that the public will be interested. This is neatly boxed, usually in a little panel. Uh, I noticed one really flare ad for maps in one of these papers. You could have a map in your home. You could have a map of the state you lived in or the city you lived in. This was a bit of an innovation at the early period of journalism. And the maps were made in two or three sizes, the most popular one being a size that fitted neatly over a fireplace so you could mount the map on your wall. Uh, the uh, really spectacular display extended into about two inches single column. This was a big ad. There was nothing in this that said, that if you do not buy this map, your friends will never speak to you again. <laughs> Nor was it remarked that this map indicated status. A map in your home made you one of an elite group of senior citizens. There was no reference to the fact that without the map, you would dwindle along through the years, unable to find your way down the street. Uh, there was no indication that this map would be out of print in 30 days, nor was there any invitation to join a map club where a dollar map would be delivered to you for 10 cents a month. All of these things were missing. It was simply a little statement of map and what it stood for. Also, I remember a little ad in an English paper about some professor who taught dialing on the side. Now, you may not know what dialing is in this country, but it is navigation and... Uh, the a power in astronomy to discover uh, various celestial and terrestrial landmarks. 
This was a very neat little ad, and at the bottom it said, anyone inquiring will please send return postage. Uh, this type of thing constituted advertising. A store opened. It was a simple, dignified statement that Jones has gone into hardware. But there was no display as we know it at all. Ads were very simple and direct. Another thing that was missing from most of the early papers was the columnist. He was an unknown factor in those days. No one seemed to need him, and no one seemed to want to have anybody else do his thinking for him. He liked to hear the news and then make his own decisions on these subjects. Uh, the uh, column for cooking was missing, probably due to the fact that at that time those interested could cook. Also, uh, there were very few beauty hints or things of this nature. Evidently, that subject was not as dynamic as it is today. Uh, common devices and implements were, seek were frequently represented in small drawings or cuts, but very seldom was anything uh, put in the newspaper simply to catch the eye. The news was recorded rather simply and, to our mind, rather dully. But as the result of this very simple procedure, no one got very neurotic over anything that they read. Crime was not featured. Delinquency was not featured. And uh, in Europe, even today, with the rapid change of things, crime is sil seldom regarded as first-rate news. Uh, there was no uh, involvement in pressure, either in selling or in buying. And the help wanted and employment opportunities were in the same very simple trend. Everything was very quiet. If you wanted to rent a room in those days, you looked through the column to find someone who would accept a paying guest. Uh, ordinary commercial rentals were practically unknown. Also, you'll find some prices that were very interesting if you look back in those days when everything was a little cheaper. A nice three-bedroom house on a large lot with a stable on the back, $15 a month. Also, you could buy a very good home and enjoy it for the rest of your life, or what we ordinarily pay for a first-class automobile. Uh, these prices, however, were not always as different as you may think. But back in the 50s, we were paying as much for some commodities as we pay today. But for the most part, prices were much lower. So the paper was a very quiet uh, journal. Smaller areas, it, issue, it was issued about once a week. Large metropolitan regions, it was a daily paper running from four to eight pages. And this was the way our fathers and forefathers got their news. It was quite possible to read such a paper from front to back at the breakfast table without dyspepsia. There was nothing about it that was going to excite you or aggravate you or worry you, although there might be at times rather serious news. Comparing that to modern journalism, we realize that the press has unfolded psychologically into a vast medium of compulsions. It has reached into our lives almost as deeply as the automobile and the freeways. It has become a tremendous force in our daily living. And this force has caught us unprepared. The individual hasn't changed his own background very much, but news is changing in front of him, and his own nature is not always able to carry the pressure of these changes. Thus, unless you approach your daily paper with some kind of integration in your own nature, you are very likely to become deeply confused. Many, many people uh, get, uh, get mad at the daily paper. They really fight with it every day. They fight also with radio and television, and even talk back to it in their better moments. <laughs> this fighting with uh, a medium such as the press is really a very sad waste of energy. Because in the very process of becoming angry, we lose most of our ability to digest or analyze anything. The moment anger comes into our hearts, 
our common sense departs. And a great deal of the press interferes with common sense simply because it perturbs us. And under the pressure of these attitudes, uh, we are no longer able to read the lines and perhaps more especially what is written between the lines. As soon as we are no longer capable of quiet judgment, we are no longer capable of common sense. So the beginning of a good and successful newspaper reader or contemporary journal devotee is a course in personal integration. Uh, you really have to learn how to read the paper. You have to gradually develop a, a large group of resources in order to be able to interpret what you read. For one thing, you have to enlarge your knowledge of geography because I've noted that uh, even young people recently out of college are unable to find a number of the locations that now appear on the map as centers of daily interest. We do not know where some of these mysterious places are. We have no idea of who is running them, and we haven't any concept whatever as to what it would mean to international affairs if these governments should fall or their particular exports should be removed from the market. So we have to have a general education and we have to be as thoughtful as possible under the pressure of the paper which merely focuses world events with or without uh, overdirection on the part of the editor. Integration then means for the newspaper reader the ability to quietly consider the values of the things which he reads. One very important uh, power which the press can convey to us is the recognition that we are a dangerous kind of creature. That man, far from being a blessing to the earth, has at some times been an outright menace. Also, we are very dangerous to each other, and uh, it becomes important for the individual to estimate his own attitudes to what degree he himself is among those dangerous people whose name might appear in the press tomorrow or the next day. So beginning with integration, we have to realize that we must read the paper from the standpoint of a view of what is important. So let's try to find out first, in our own thinking, what we regard as important. First of all, we do firmly believe that it is important that the average citizen know as much as he can about world affairs. This helps to overcome the tendency toward mental provincialism that is a common heritage. Uh, we are mostly concerned with ourselves and with our own immediate environments. We are concerned with our jobs and our families and our neighbors. This has a tendency to cause a certain neglect of public responsibility or civic duty. Consequently, we must begin to think a little broad, more broadly and a little more deeply if we expect to be good members of modern society. We also have to have a direction just the same as the editor has a direction. Our problem is always to try to find the facts, whether he present, presents them or conceals them. In order to do this, we must gradually come to know what the editor or editorial policy of a journal stands for. If it has certain definite, known, fixed policies, we will expect these to color the news. And if we want to know the facts, we must know how much of this color we should take out with our own thinking. We have to try to determine what the policy of a program now functioning in society really is. Otherwise, we will be very quickly uh, self-deceived when we attempt to study the paper and its content. Our own basic integration calls for a strong personal policy. And this personal policy must be seated in honesty. 
What we really want is that we shall find out as far as we can what is happening, what it means, and how it affects us and other people. With this thought clearly in mind, we must try to understand something of the world in which we live, the world that apparently the newspaper man never thinks of, the world of values and of principles and of energies uh, which uh, we belong to. Finally, all policy making in this world arises in the universe itself. The universe is the policy maker. The laws of the universe are the rules of the game. And everything that happens in some way reveals the relationship between man and universal law. Everything that happens either proves that man is working with law or it proves that he is working against law. Wherever an individual is in trouble, he has made a mistake. Where nations are in trouble, they have made mistakes. Where the world is in trouble, it has made mistakes. Trouble is always a mistake. Trouble is always some effort on the part of someone to break the rules of the game. Now, if we have a fair and adequate understanding of the rules of the game, we suddenly become aware of the value of news, not only because it shows us how these rules work, but also it shows us what happens to those who disobey these rules. Now, this is the beginning, it seems to me, of a successful newspaper reader, that he has within himself a concept of rules, and that these rules relate to the conduct of every living thing. Perhaps the most obvious law that appears in the journals of the world is the working of the law of cause and effect. We little realize in reading accounts that we are picking out only a fragment of an incident. The newspaper tells that the man was arrested for a certain crime or that he was involved in a certain unfavorable situation. The newspaper does not moralize on this, nor does it indicate any strong pattern of ethical purposes. It may give us very little insight as to what led up to the incident, or very little understanding of what is going to be the result of the circumstance which it notes. But the human being has to fill in these areas and gradually to recognize something that the newspaper reader does not always recognize, namely that underneath all news is justice, whether we recognize it, believe it, or can find it or not. Thus, in the mind of the reader, all these separate incidents recorded under various conditions reflecting the industrial, scientific, and political state of nations, reflecting upon community life and the uses and abuses of our conveniences and advantages. All of these become manifestations of a lawful pattern that underlies the events of mankind. Cause and effect tells us that every fragment of dramatic news that we read is an effect. It is the consequence of something that has been set in motion. And having reached this cataclysmic crisis, which we call news, it becomes a new cause from which will descend further effects involving the lives of many persons and perhaps bringing tragedy uh, to uh, countless individuals. So under our general thinking, let us keep a pattern of laws that news is merely a report upon some stage of the unfoldment of a pattern, whether this pattern is individual or collective, whether this pattern is merely the dramatic unfoldment of the life of a private citizen 
or whether it is the story of the development of a great political theory, a great scientific discovery, or a great religious conviction. We must look for law. And because we live very much like news rather than like history, we are not always able to find this basic factor. We do not find it in our own daily experiences. We wake up in the morning, certain things happen to us. Perhaps they are only news to ourselves. There would be no interest to anyone else. But we do not recognize these happenings as in some way related to a pattern. Yet there is not a move that we make or a thought that we think that does not have a cause and will not lead to an effect. But in our own thinking, we shut out the backgrounds, we overlook the futures, and we try to live simply here and now. Perhaps one of the points where cause and effect is most obvious is in speculation and the daily reports upon investments and upon the stock exchange. Here we see how the most intricate emotional reactions of human beings can affect the financial destiny of a country. So with a pattern of law underneath, we are able to do something about this. We can realize that news is not a complete report, that when we read it, we have only received one symptom of a situation. And if we are going to learn anything from news, we must be able to restore that situation from that symptom. All news reports are a form of diagnosis. They bring to our attention certain evidences of pressures or conditions or circumstances. We must rationalize this evidence, unfold it, and use it as a means of further strengthening and directing our own courses of conduct. Under this process, news becomes a textbook a textbook of the immediate, a textbook bearing upon the very situation that we will pass through in each passing day, the mood of the moment, the anger, the hatred, the grief, the grievances, the criticisms, uh, which come to us at a certain hour or at a certain place. These are recorded in their exaggerated forms in the press. But these same moods are moving us, they are the contemporary, immediate pressures to which we all respond to some measure. Now, the next thing, perhaps, that we have to bear in mind in considering news is that it can be very disillusioning. Now, why should news be disillusioning? First, in many instances, it appears to be unjust, and that unjust things should happen is a kind of disappointment to the souls of men. Another reason why it may be disillusioning is because it undermines our confidence in the achievements of our peoples. We begin to wonder how we can claim the advancements with which we have adorned ourselves and at the same time be subject to such rudimentary and uncontrollable passions and pressures. Uh, news can be disillusioning because it seems to indicate the world is not going anywhere, that nothing seems to be getting any better. It seems to be only getting more complicated. News can be more than disillusioning. It can be frightening as it pre presents to our consideration the very dangerous crises into which collectives and individuals uh, can come at various stages of the development of society. So as we read the paper, we begin to lose faith in our fellow men. We begin to wonder what kind of a world we are living in. It looks as though crime and trouble are increasing everywhere, and that there is really very little indication that man is moving serenely toward any worthwhile objective. But let us always bear in mind, however, uh, that this disillusionment of news 
is only a public statement of something that we would discover if we sat down quietly and talked with ourselves about ourselves. Let us remember that as human beings, we are growing more slowly than we realize. We come to various stages of what we regard as a civilized state. We feel ourselves to be pretty good basic people. We think that we have benefited from education, that we are enjoying conveniences and securities never before known. Yet the average person is guilty in small ways of most of the mistakes that make headlines in our papers. The uh, mistakes may not be as dramatic as those which are recorded, but they are the same basic indications that the individual is not as solid in his culture as he thinks he is. He is not as integrated as he believes himself to be. For most individuals with a very slight pressure lose integration. Uh, they become involved in attitudes which they later regret and which could never be regarded as an adornment to character. They simply are unable to be as big under pressure as they expect other people to be under their pressures. This does not mean, however, that man is not improving. It does not mean that the law of evolution is not at work in the land. It does mean, however, that the law of evolution has always operated in very close conformity with the law of cause and effect. Up to now, man has never been able to grow by the simple and glorious method of reaching out and embracing progress. The individual has never been able to change his attitudes in a happy and wonderful way, especially if the change is one which he does not enjoy. Nearly all change is uncomfortable. It makes no difference what it may be. We have a resistance against it. We have a tremendous resistance to progress. We have a resistance to those improvements of character by means of which, as individuals, we could advance progress. Man has two states of mind in which he uh, exists. One is the familiar. And no matter how uncomfortable this is, he likes it. The other state is the unfamiliar. And no matter how important it may be, he dislikes it. We have become accustomed uh, to certain mistakes. They seem to us to be like old shoes. They feel well when we wear them, even though they destroy our feet. Any change that comes along frightens us. Any challenge which takes us away from the small patterns with which we have become accustomed appears dangerous. We find this in connection with religion and philosophy very strongly as we look back through history. Every step of man's religious progress has been accompanied by pain. Every effort at moral growth has led to the martyrdom of great souls. Every sincere desire to advance the cause of human good has been re resisted emphatically by the very persons who would be most benefited. If we therefore look at things around us and have a brief recourse to history, we should gain a very definite personal lesson. And that is the wrongness of being a confirmed reactionary. In nature, things either grow or die. Nothing remains the same. Growth is nearly always painful. Therefore, the unpleasant thing may be the greater good, whether we wish to accept it as such or not. In an effort to retain the status in quo, which most folks really like, we may deny the importance of change. We may subconsciously fight against it, even though consciously we advocate it. 
This brings us to another phase of our daily contact with the press. Man reacts on two levels simultaneously to news. One is his conscious level and the other is his subconscious. His conscious level is as rational as he can make it because his conscious level is open to his own awareness. If he becomes stupid, his own awareness points this out and he is a little bit ashamed of himself. He also has certain conscious censorship over his attitudes, especially these attitudes which are out in the open where he himself can contact them. But behind this conscious mind, which exercises a certain censorship over our own attitudes, there is an unconscious or subconscious pressure. And this pressure often is opposed to the very things that the mind itself would be inclined to accept. Thus, underneath our conscious action, we will find a mass of unconscious reaction. Reaction which tears us and pulls us and takes apart the very integration that we are attempting to establish. So we have to be careful that we bring together these two levels in some way so that we will not oppose internally what we accept externally. We have a sort of split personality in this problem. And uh, very often the unconscious pressure is not as noble or as progressive or as understanding as the conscious decisions of our minds. But because it is internal pressure, we do not resist it adequately, nor do we censor it. We sort of accept it and assume it has to be that way. Because we all have our own attitudes and prejudices, the press has a tendency to support them. We will always find something in the paper that points out that we were right on some attitude that we hold. Sometimes this attitude is constructive, but often it is not. In any event, we find what we look for. Therefore, we must try to look for that which is important and look for that which is valuable in our integration of ourselves. For the private citizen, the paper has only one function, and that function is educational. Actually, I suppose that the editors would drop dead if they suspected that they were issuing educational journals. Also, I assume that the average person would be deeply embarrassed and offended if he suspected that the press was educating him. Because education is one of these problems that we all want, but no one wishes to admit it. Education is something that we need, uh, but we hate to admit that there is any deficiency of it in our present attitudes. It's a sort of a personal insult. So we ha have a number of strange problems that the press has to face because the press is concerned with this tremendous popular mind. And the popular mind is more difficult to diagnose than any mental ailment that has been subjected to psychological research. The popular mind is a name for something which is very attenuated and very inconsistent. But the journal tries in its way to reach this popular mind. One thing the popular mind is greatly opposed to today, and that is moralism. If you write a book nowadays in which you express any directive on a moral level, your book will not be published. If there is the slightest suggestion of preachment, you're going to offend somebody immediately. Consequently, the process is to try to attain uh, a style which makes possible teachment without preachment. There is no law against informing people, but there is an unwritten law that they must not know it, because if they suspect it, they will never read the book. 
The same thing has happened in art and music and motion pictures and television. Under no condition must you inform anybody, except in those small periods set aside for government educational activity. In these periods, you can be informed or misinformed uh, as uh, industriously as possible. But in so-called general programming and in journalism, you must never teach anybody anything. Well, this in itself is an impossible task because no matter what you say, you are teaching somebody something. And here is where the press remains valuable in spite of its own effort not to be. It is teaching us. It is explaining to us every day why its own attitudes are wrong and why our attitudes are wrong if we accept such judgments. Uh, we are reminded that the circulation of a newspaper is its life. Without this circulation, it cannot exist. Circulation means that people want to read it. A number of attempts have been made in this country to establish newspapers that did not scandalize. Newspapers of simple news proportions. Papers that had no controlling policy. That tried to tell the truth and tried to present news in a manner in which young people could be subjected to it without danger of moral injury. These papers have all failed. No one supported them. Maybe we should not say no one, but the minority group was too small to have any bearing upon the survival of a business venture. Thus, it is true that if the news we get is not the news we want, one of the reasons is that we get the news we pay for. And if we prefer to pay for what we are getting, this is what we will get. The press has its finger on the public pulse pretty much of the time. And if the people become more interested in positive value, they will get it. If they are continuing to be interested only in the negative presentation of the news as we have it today, this is what they will continue to receive. And this is a noble example of the operation of the law of cause and effect. There are reasons for things. And as we become aware of the reasons, we nearly always become aware that we are contributing in one way or another to these reasons, and that we are getting very largely what we deserve, that which we demand or require, or that which we do not have the courage to resist. Thus things go on much as we see them every day of our lives. Another important basic concept to underlie news and news coverage is its attitude on matters which cause fear in the public mind. Nearly always the daily paper gives us a certain amount of fear. There is always something happening nearby or far away that could have happened to us. And this comes home to us uh, very personally because each person reads the paper as a person, and he brings to bear upon it the most personal and intimate of his own attitudes and feelings. Here we have uh, good evidence of the rising fear that we have of crime, the rising fear that we have of the world crisis, which is gathering on the horizon, the fear we have of accidents, and all kinds of other secondary fears when we read that there have been burglaries in the neighborhood and things of that nature. There is a certain fear mechanism that arises from news. What are we doing about this? Are we simply being afraid? Or are we definitely attempting to find some principle of truth underlying these various reports? Are we as individuals living in a thoughtful and safe manner? Are we making proper use of what we hear or read in order that it may guide us not to make the mistakes or do the things 
uh, which are reported as dangerous. In some instances, we are probably affected to a degree. Here, for example, we can take two fields of thought that have become rather pre prevalent in recent times. Our daily papers carry every day the statements of accidents due to motorists, motor travel on our various highways and freeways. We are appalled at the amount of damage that man does to man in this contraption which we call an automobile. We are aware of the fact that haste has become one of the great killers of our times. Yet reading these reports daily and having them summarized for us weekly and monthly throughout the year and banner-headed in our publications frequently, there is no definite indication that we are able to use this news to prevent the continuance of this condition. We are therefore forced to admit that we are well informed of the danger and that we are willing to continue to act dangerously. We are willing to continue to do these things which are the cause of probable damage and death. At this time, we are killing more people by automobile accidents in the United States than we lost in both world wars. Yet this does not seem to affect our general sense of responsibility. It does not cause us to realize how dangerous this instrument is, which has become our family commodity. Therefore, news will not operate unless news reaches in to a rational core of our own integrity. Now, there is very little probability that accident news is particularly colored by political prejudice. These reports are not of the kind which we might suspect to be dramatized or untrue. They are pretty factual with the names and addresses of the deceased. Yet, therefore, we cannot hide behind the fact that someone is perhaps making up this news. We know it is true. We see it is true. And in the course of years, we have all seen these accidents that have occurred. Yet with all this very factual situation, we are not able to use news as a means of correcting the very evils which it reports. Somewhere along the line, this news simply does not reach into us. It does not cause us to change our ways for the better. Because there is a tremendous moral value in these accident reports. They could preach more than a sermon if we would listen. Yet they are non-dogmatic. They are simply telling truths that we all recognize but we do not cope with these truths in an adequate manner. In the last five years, practically all of the experts in this country have been working on the problem of juvenile delinquency. From G. Edgar Hoover down, reports have been published. Lengthy articles have appeared in the press, and there is scarcely a daily paper that does not record some example of juvenile delinquency. There is no particular reason to suppose that these accounts are colored by any political partisanship. They are simply reports of things that have occurred and have been picked from the blotters of the police courts or the, village, or the city morgue. What then is the reason why this tremendous emphasis upon a worldwide situation is comparatively ignored. How does it happen that we continue to go along with complete complacency about news of this kind, and yet if there is a dash of political coloring show up, we are immediately infuriated? We expect uh, news to be trustworthy, but when news that vitally affects us is trustworthy, it does not seem to react to cause us 
to become more attentive or more aware. Now, it is probably true that this news has been a deterrent in some cases and has accomplished something. But it certainly has not proven to us that if we have the facts, we will do something about them. It has just left us in a state of uh, sorrow, of uh, depression owing to this situation, but we haven't done anything about it. Also, you will seldom find a newspaper that does not point out the degree to which alcoholism contributes to delinquencies. We find constant reference to serious accidents in which alcoholism plays a part. We also find constant references to broken homes due to this problem, or neglected children or juvenile delinquents that trace their records back to alcoholic homes. We've had this little problem sitting on our doorstep for 10,000 years, and it still sits there. And the individual feels that any effort to interfere with his rights constitutes an unconstitutional action. So news where it brings us interesting and important lessons does not seem to have the penetration that it should have. There's only one reason why it doesn't penetrate, and that is that we do not accept the penetration. We do not permit this news to cause us to do something. We do not permit it to interfere with the neglecting of children. We do not allow it to interfere with our alcoholic consumption. And we do not allow it to interfere with our personal pleasures. Yet if this news was wrong, we would condemn it. Yet it is right and we ignore it. Thus it is hard to realize or believe that the power of the press is as great as we are inclined to think. Actually, its power is only to the degree that it supports us. Whatever we think, whether it is good or bad, that we will continue to do, supporting ourselves by the press, but not allowing real facts to greatly influence our attitudes towards the problems of the day. This means, again, that the individual has got to integrate more of his own personal thoughtfulness and bring it to bear upon the management of his affairs. Nearly every paper today carries accounts of business failure, warns of unemployment, or indicates the insecure state of the investment markets. Individuals pay very, very little attention to these facts, unless they happen to be directly investors at the moment. Even then, they do not learn. They simply hope or fear. The paper means to us that it is an available source of knowledge, but unless we use it, this knowledge cannot markedly alter any of our affairs. So we will assume for the moment that you are going to read the morning paper and that as a result of this violent impulse, you are expecting to start off the day well aware of the circumstances most likely to dominate. In this awareness, however, you approach the paper with an attitude already. Either you are a strong supporter of the paper's basic policy, or you are a conscientious objector but like the sports section. In any event, uh, you must begin by estimating what parts and degrees of these reports you can actually believe. And where you are not certain, Put the facts quietly away for further consideration. Here's another problem. Most papers are highly directive in their statement, statements, attempting to force you to assume immediately an attitude. The wise person simply will not do this. He will note and consider 
and wait to see how things work out. And very often he will find where the prejudices may lie. If, however, he is simply a negative sponge and takes into himself whatever he reads, emoting uh, with each article in a manner consistent with the direction of the article, he will already have a very tired, fatigued state by the time he gets through. Instead of being able to go to work fresh and ready to start the labors of the day, he has been worn out before he starts. He has wasted too much energy. Also, what he has read may influence or affect him too immediately in his contact with other people. He may subconsciously react to something that he has read and cause a difficulty in his family or in his business. He has to be an observer. Plato pointed out long ago, and several of the other Greek philosophers agreed, that there are two relationships which man can occupy to life. One is a participant and the other is an observer. The individual who is a participant usually wears himself out rather quickly. He is up to his neck in everything. To every situation he gives the full support of his emotional intensity. He is constantly mixed up in things, whether he has any interest in them really or not, or whether he can do anything about them or not. He simply lives, uh, as he might say, in full participation. He is constantly uh, moved by every circumstance. Everything that happens is very personal. He reacts to all bad news as though it were a direct insult aimed at him. He reacts to all pressures with a measure of grief that he might normally reserve only for the greatest emergencies of life. The other type of person is the observer. And an observer is a person who lives in this world but not of it. And we are assured in Scripture that this is the most desirable way to live. That we are here to observe, and through observation, to learn the lessons that we need for our own conduct. The observer sits quietly by and watches the unfoldment of the drama of life. There are moments when he may seem to be picked up in it, just as we may seem to be involved in a great theater or a great motion picture. But for the most part, the wise person, desiring to gain the most from living, tries to maintain the position of the observer. He he wants to see the world unfold around him. He wants to benefit and to give help wherever possible but he does not want to become so involved in the situation that he loses his own point of view, or loses his own freedom, or loses his own initiative. He does not wish to be tossed about on the surface of news like a little ship without a rudder. He does not want to be overwhelmed by the tempests of reports. Rather, he wishes to use these things as means of steering his own vessel to the proper harbor. To the degree that we become emotionally involved in this type of problem, to that degree we lose the clarity of insight by which the reports of history are important to us. Now, man belongs to a large world, but he lives in only a small part of it. Each citizen has his own environment and his own neighborhood. News has made it possible for him to really live in all of the world. It has made it possible for him to share in the problems and experiences of many peoples. It enables him also uh, to see how his own attitudes and instincts work out on the larger theater of human relationships. We recognize that there are only certain basic emotions of which the human being is possible, is uh, capable of expressing. 
We also know that these emotions and basic principles are operating everywhere. And under pressure of circumstances, these emotions break through to change the course of history. Yet when a nation gets into a certain difficulty by its own attitude, let us remember that among our own people in our own neighborhood are countless persons with this same attitude. And when something happens on the other side of the world that seems to detract from our cultural progress, it is moved by an emotion which may be our emotion or one very similar to it. Everywhere, people are doing things. They are bringing into manifestation the same potentials that we possess. Each time they do something, it could be ourselves doing that thing. Or it could be that some policy which we have long advocated suddenly becomes the policy of some distant nation, and in a short time that nation is at war. It means that this policy is operating. In us, it may only be a thought. Someone else is trying to live by that thought. News makes it possible for us to see how different thoughts and different feelings moving into action produce their consequences. And we are not very wise if we assume uh, that our thought uh, is going to be more successful than the same kind of thought brought into political life somewhere else. Thus, news tells us what thoughts, feelings, and emotions do when they break through. And they could be ours, and very often they are identical with ours. Are we learning, at least vicariously, by these other experiences? Are we finding out how our lives would operate if our secret thoughts came into manifestation and directed our conduct. If we are able to make this analysis, we are becoming psychopolitically conscious. We are recognizing political entities as psychic entities, driven by the same pressures as individuals. And we begin to understand what might happen if our pressures escaped control as they very often do escape control in nations in the making of history. Thus, everywhere we see people with various instincts and attitudes trying to work out the things which they themselves believe. We also, in reading the paper, become more aware, perhaps, of the basic solidarity of peoples we discover that they are trying in many ways to do certain things which they regard to be good. That in large measure they are experimenting with good because there does not seem as yet to be any infallible pattern by which we can assure peace between countries or happiness between persons. But we do recognize more and more that the boundaries of nations and continents do not represent any essential differences in the consciousness of peoples. In all parts of the world, people are trying to be happy. They are trying to grow. They are trying to protect their principles against both public and private despotism. They are struggling for their rights to exist. They are seeking greater educational opportunities. They are, most of them, building on long-range hope of good, even though the immediate pattern may be one of discord and perhaps even tragedy. So the, the newspaper ties the world together. It brings us more and more the concept of this one family, and causes us to now recognize things happening 10,000 miles away as just as important and even more important than the things happening in our own communities. This gives us a little larger internationalism. And here, of course, there is again a mixture of opinion, whether it is good for us to be internationalists or not, whether it would be better for us to mind our own business and let other people mind theirs. 
but the newspaper has made this impossible, and the old ways will probably not come back. We are confronted with the inevitability of a world attitude. We must take attitudes on things that not long ago would have been of slight importance to us. We can no longer evade the challenge of personal opinion. Uh, the fact that we do have attitudes and that we do intend uh, to express ourselves. Thus, all in all, in spite of our negative attitudes on some phases of the press, and these are quite justified, we are probably better off with it than we would be without it. We would be still better off, however, if we knew how to use it. Nearly everything that we have can serve us, and it can also hurt us. We are better off with the conveniences that we have, unless we permit them to so dominate our lives that they make us miserable. It is our own tendency to excess that gets us into trouble with nearly every commodity which we have ever been able to devise. But rather than be without news, I think it is better that we face this challenge of confusion and try to do something about it. News also through the press carries a tremendous selling power. Advertising has become one of the great phenomena of our day. But there is much to indicate that this also has become excessive and that gradually the value of advertising is being destroyed by its own uh, excess, that there is far too much, and that there are too many identical or similar products competing vainly for control of world markets. From a study even of the advertising section, we can learn a number of things. After all, nearly all advertising is planned by individuals who feel that they have their finger on the pulse of public opinion. Advertising experts are highly trained specialists in interpreting the attitudes of people. Nearly all important advertising arises, therefore, from a deep, penetrating study, survey, and polling of public opinion. If, therefore, we do not like advertising, we feel that it is too flamboyant, we feel that it is misdirective, or is in some way quite deficient in ethics, then let us remember that this is the advertising that sells, and it is selling to us, even though we resent it. If, therefore, there is lack of ethics in advertising, it is because there is lack of ethics in the consumer. There is lack of understanding, lack of thoughtfulness, and uh, it is known uh, by experts that if you say it loud enough, say it often enough, and exaggerate it sufficiently, people will believe it. This is the theory of life. Now, if this is a fact, and advertising pretty well proves that it's a fact, then there's something we can learn. That we can learn that we are wrong. That we are simply contributing to our own troubles. And that it is our own thoughtlessness as to the true value of products that makes this kind of advertising possible. So we take it right back to our own natures and see to what degree we are supporting the thing which we actually resent. Thus, as we go along through the paper from department to department, it is telling us constantly about ourselves. It is showing how it believes we can be influenced, and it believes with a certain expert skill, because its believing is very carefully systematized and very astutely um, proven through tabulations, and through various ma mathematical procedures. Thus it is telling us what we are really doing, whether we want to believe it or not. Actually, after we get through with all of these different phases of the press, we come to the realization that we must either uh, dig our own roots deeper or continue to be influenced out of face by the things that are happening around us? The answer is that we've got to 
gradually organized not among ourselves into some organization for preservation against the press, but organizing our own faculties to preserve ourselves against misdirection or excess. We know this is true, but we know how difficult it is to change ourselves. We have been working on it, experts have been working on it since the beginning of time. What is it that can happen that can cause an individual to joyfully do what he does not want to do. Now, there's the important catch. Or how can we make an individual take an attitude which personally he does not like? It may be good for him, but he doesn't like it. It's the same problem we have in the effort to apply the Ten Commandments to the larger social state of man. How can we actually prove to the human being that the brotherhood of man is the solution of his problem? How can we make it stick that the the answer to nearly every problem that we face today is in the simple statement of Jesus, love one another? Here's the answer. No one denies it. No one would ever dare to deny it. Even the largest metropolitan press would not dare to deny it. It would lose all its subscribers. (laughs) Everyone admits that it is true, but the phenomenon remains that we do not love one another. We don't love the man who has a dollar more than we have. We don't love anybody who borrows our lawn (laughs) more. We don't love the individual who gets to the bargain table ahead of us and gets the only one that would have fitted us. (laughs) We do not love the individual who shoots ahead of us and makes a right turn in traffic. We do not love these people. We do not love anyone who wants what we want or gets it before we do. We do not love people who disagree with us or who have other attitudes on subjects. We do not love people who succeed better than we do. There seems to be very little way in which we can take a very simple fact and make it operate. I would say that the average newspaper, with all of its crimes and delinquencies, that in the course of one reading of one paper, an individual could thoughtfully make at least a hundred useful discoveries, and they wouldn't be in the cooking section either. They would be discoveries about what happens when you do things well, what happens when you do not do them well. There would be a record of just exactly what selfishness does to man and what kindness and honor do for man. It's there every day in one article or another. No one put it in to preach. It was just the facts as they unfolded in some common incident. But the truth is there. You have bombarded by this truth and infinite repetitions of it, 365 days a year, not only in the press, but in news releases on the air, television, and everything of this nature, even the most simple plots of our motion pictures and theaters still carry certain of these lessons. In the last hundred years, we have been exposed to this type of instruction as never before in history. And we have also been exposed to the tremendous calamity that comes where these principles are neglected. Yet we cannot seem to get any further than voting for something. It is easy enough to vote, but it is not so easy to do and to some way pick up the message that the world is giving us and putting it to work. 
This is the great problem. How are we going to take facts that tell us that when we do certain things, we will suffer certain consequences? When are we going to get to the point when this will mean that we will stop doing these things? That's a good question, and no one has an answer. And psychology tries to tell us why we do not have an answer. Perhaps they can't give us the answer, but they can give us some of the reasons. One of the most important reasons for all this is the tremendous subconscious load of the person. Man has been selfish by action since the beginning of his created existence. He has always been struggling for self-preservation, and he has applied this term to every level of his conduct. And as self-preservation became not only the preserving of his body, but the preserving of his goods, and as self-preservation extended to the preservation of his luxuries, and further intellectually to the preservation of his point of view, whether it is any good or not, while this pressure continues to force its way out from inside of man, the comparatively recently acquired intellectual uh, censorship is not adequate. In 99 cases out of 100, the individual will ultimately do what he feels like doing. May resist it for a while, may have a big fight with himself, but in the long run, what he has always wanted to do, that he will do. Unfortunately, that which he has always wanted to do has seldom been that which was best for him. But again, he apparently is willing to face the danger of the uncertain future caused by wrong action rather than to correct the action. Yet he picks up the paper and sees where an individual who insisted on doing what he wants to do has just gone to prison for murder. Yet this doesn't stop the individual. It only causes him to pray that he will not get caught. How are we going to fight this particular inertia? How are we going to in some way move the person from his complete dedication to the fulfillment of his own desire? Now consciously he believes his desires are good. The reason he believes they are good is because if he gets what he wants, he believes he will be satisfied. He never is, but he's always hoping. Several great world thinkers have tried to work this thing through. And in both the East and the West, there has been common accord as to the only known solution. Namely, that the entire problem is rooted in selfishness. And that some way, selfishness has to be overcome. Selfishness was struck philosophically and religiously down through the ages, by some very competent people. Pythagoras, for example, when a disciple joined his community, required that this disciple place all of his personal possessions in the community and reserve nothing for himself. The same concept held true in Buddhism in India, where the monk became a person without possession and also in Christendom, where the early rise of monastic orders resulted, as in the case of the Franciscans and the Benedictines, the creation of organizations of poverty in which the individual gave up or relinquished all personal claim to worldly goods, and in many instances all personal claim even to his own name or to his own identity. Both Buddha and Jesus recognized that man's constant fight to preserve 
that which he has has resulted in the loss of that which he is. <coughs> Against this point, however, today we have a um, great many uh, difficulties. The average person cannot live without anything. He cannot wander about like the mendicant friars of the Middle Ages. He cannot wander about as the holy men of India wandered about 50 or 100 years ago. He is caught in a very difficult economic system which causes him to become ever more mindful of survival and of the survival of his goods. Thus it is this central point of personal security based upon what we have and based upon the continuance of a policy which will protect what we have. Here lies one of our major difficulties. The only answer now, as far as we can realize, is that the individual must gradually revise his basic attitude toward what he has. Not necessarily give it up, or throw it away, or bestow it upon holy orders, but that gradually he shall recognize the importance of removing his point of emphasis from the preservation of his goods to the salvation of himself. This is a very big step for most people, but uh, there it's not as big a step as it used to be. Because more and more, what we have is threatened. More and more, taxation cuts into our possessions. More and more, we are re able to recognize that life itself is limited and that whatever we have, we must leave it behind. Possessions are not the solid things we used to think they were. Debt can take them away. All kinds of situations can undermine them. <coughs> but the fact remains that man is not here finally to possess. He is here to become. And if possession destroys his honesty, then it is important that he clings to his honesty. I think, therefore, that a reorganization of our sense of possession, the great effort that was made by Plato, Socrates, Jesus, and Buddha, to make us realize that happiness is not in what we have, but in our ability to live well, and that happiness is our greatest wealth that if this could gradually come into our consciousness, we would then be able to learn without destroying the merit of the message by permitting it to be destroyed in its turn by our economic position and our economic attitude. I do not think we can ever weigh news honestly until we can escape from the greatest prejudice of all, namely the effect of news upon what we have. We've got to get around, finally, to the possibility of using news to help us to unfold what we are. The person who is without ulterior motive, really, can use a newspaper very advantageously. But if he has an ulterior motive, he is going to distort that news even more than the editor could. And to meet this issue, the person has got to find some way to bring together the two levels of his own consciousness. That level which is forever thinking about his own advantage, immediate, and the other which is thinking about his ultimate good and happiness. These must unite into one pattern. That which is ultimately good is immediately good. And we can no longer divide these ranges of action and reaction. So I would suggest that if possible, we try to relax a little on this problem of our own possessions. Now it's quite conceivable 
uh, that we would actually be better off economically and every other way if we reached a point where we could handle what we have impartially and impersonally. As long as our financial program is spurred by fear or avarice, we are going to make bad investments. As long as our own attitudes obscure the clarity of our common sense, we are much in danger of losing that which we do have. If, however, we could become administrators, impartial, doing things as wisely and gently as we know because that is the proper way to do them, if we could accept loss and gain without being overwhelmed by it, if we could move very quietly and reasonably through the economic process of life, we would probably end a little more comfortable, much happier, and perhaps even richer. Because our own confusion psychologically is one of the reasons why we fall apart economically. To get this pressure of ulterior purpose out of our judgment would suddenly open up for us the world of things that news can tell us. It would also make it possible for us to recognize the universal good that is moving behind news, whether we appreciate it immediately or not. It would help us to find faith in the fact that there are laws governing conduct, because you cannot read a paper for a week without hundreds of examples of cause and effect coming straight to you. But we have to cultivate the attitude of observation of these things. So it depends entirely what we are, whether or not we can survive the news. If we have to survive it as we survive life. The average person does not survive life. He loses most of the value of life 25 years before he dies. But we have to survive facts, and we can survive facts by discovering that they are right and good. We can also gradually develop the kind of inner insight which would make it impossible for an editorial policy to fool us. But it fools us because it caters to something we want to believe. And when the only thing we want to believe is the truth, we can find that also, because it is there even though it may be distorted to some degree. If then our main problem is to try to become informed in what is going on in the world, we can choose the best and most appropriate journals that we know for this purpose, and we can then go to work on ourselves. It isn't always the question whether the newspaper is safe for us. The question is, are we safe for the newspaper? Is it possible for us to read this paper without committing some form of an intellectual harakiri on ourselves? Are we destroying ourselves by our own misinterpretation of the things happening around us? The newspaper, I don't think we can afford to ignore it. I don't think we can afford not to read it, but we certainly cannot afford to be destroyed by it. But we don't have to be. All we have to do is to develop a little of the common sense and integration that we know is right. And from a strong religious philosophical foundation, we can read anything safely. But not only will we know the facts, but we will have sufficient emotional control so that we do not disturb ourselves. Rather, we clarify thinking toward solution. It is nice, perhaps, to be sorry for a disaster. It is nicer, however, to inwardly sit down to the quiet problem of thinking through that disaster and trying to make certain that in any way that we can, we will unite to prevent a recurrence of it. It is to get action rather than emotion into our lives. In this way, parents, friends, family, business associates, 
all can read the paper and get something they can use. For in spite of its mysterious concealments and perversions, it is like the great face of nature itself. For behind the mountains and valleys and forests and rivers and lakes of earth, one sees the laws that cause these things, the great principle of universal integrity coming through the strange conglomerate of earthly phenomena. In the same way, the great integrities come through news, and if we are observant of them, we can grow wiser and better and also come to worship more truly and sincerely the great principle of value, the great power of universal consciousness that nothing can completely distort, but which keeps on bursting through as it does in man, moving his conduct gradually in the direction of that which is right. Ooh, time's up, time's up, time's up, time's up. I have uh, good news for you. Next Sunday you have a vacation. <laughs> and uh, the following Sunday we're going to take up the problem of the principles under luck, change, and coincidence. What happens that causes strange things to happen to you? This is, I think, an interesting problem for everyone concerned. I'd like to also announce at this time... Uh, that we still have a few copies of the 1962 conjunction lecture notes. And we also have something that will help you to read the paper intelligently, and that is our little booklet, uh, The Quiet Way. You see, if you get nice and quiet before you read it, the, not the booklet, the paper, you will then be able to read the paper and come out in one piece. So we strongly advise something of that nature. The Autumn Journal is also available, and as you probably, many of you know at this time, uh, we are, uh, we've had a copy, a nice copy made in a nice sepia tone of that wonderful old picture from our collection, The Vinegar Tasters. The three wise men, Buddha, Confucius, and Lao Tse, tasting of the vinegar of life. This is a good probably a subject to go with the newspaper also because it can likewise be the vinegar that we all have to taste. So uh, there is a special arrangement if you are a subscriber and your subscription to the journal extends beyond the winter issue, uh, you are entitled to secure this picture at a special price, as you will find at the table. Or if you wish to subscribe, you can also have the uh, new subscription to our journal and the picture at a special saving. So if you're interested in it, or think it make an interesting Christmas present, we suggest you very carefully look into it. PRS Study Group, the center group, meets today uh, and uh, in the lecture room upstairs, and it'll meet shortly after the lecture uh, in order to give folks time to gather and have a cup of coffee and chat with their friends. So after you have had your participation in the coffee clutch, we hope that you will then go up and discuss the subject of the morning with the headquarters study group. You're most cordially invited to be there. The library will be open for an hour or so after the lecture this morning. The current art display will not be seen after this week, so if you haven't seen it, we hope you'll drop in. We also have framed some copies of the Tibetan Chinese prints from the whole collection, which we have told you about before. You might like to see these framed copies. Uh, as they present a rather simplified way of getting the pictures right onto your walls. Friends there will tell you about them. Also, we have some other prints and uh, art objects which might be of interest uh, as Christmas gifts or as a present for yourself. Uh, and being very impersonal, we always have to be sure that in our impersonality, we are fair to ourselves. Of course, this has not been one of our major troubles, but at the same, <laughs> at the same time, it could happen, you know. I've known people who were fair to everyone but themselves. For instance, I know people who believe that they should sacrifice their own happiness completely for some other selfish person. This individual isn't being fair to himself, whether he believes it or not. So uh, also visit our arts collection 
you see something you like, just be fair to yourself. You always have been in those things. And uh, incidentally, we save you the cost of newspaper advertising. Anyway, visit our various facilities, and we hope that you will have a very pleasant Labor Day weekend. Be safe and careful, and that a week from next Sunday we will gather again. Thank you very much.